Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be finishing up our series on the docks and <laughs> now the Dornier 10. And we're going to be experiencing at the takeoff a little bit of navigation as well as landing this huge, huge plane. Now the good news is, and I, first of all, I love the fact they have these little assisters for aerodynamics, for controls. Man, this thing's tough to turn. But we're going to be taking a look today, like I said, as the basics of takeoff and get this thing back on the ground. Navigation on this is uh, relatively involved on account of the fact that this was designed for a crew of 10. I'm a crew of one. So it makes it a little involved, but you'll see what I mean when we get there. So let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, uh, this aircraft takes off by time, not necessarily by speed, but from a Microsoft Flight Simulator perspective, we actually take off based on a bang, 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 bang on the water. It's hard to describe, but it's one of those things that when you get there, I'll be able to point it out to you so you know what you're looking for vibration-wise to let you know that you're getting ready for takeoff, kind of a thing like that. Once we are in the air, um, we have very, very, very little information. Uh, they did give us documentation with this airplane, but basically nobody knows anything because I don't speak German, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, it depends. No room for other languages? I have no idea. But the big thing here that we have to keep in mind is that this is a big plane, and it is not the highest performance plane. You'll see what I mean. So in a previous video, uh, we did use the tugboat to get ourselves mostly lined up here. If we needed to, we could actually come back here and adjust it if we had to. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and disengage the anchors and then we're ready to go. So getting this thing going, it's uh, normally what I do is I call back behind us and I'd say, would you be so kind as to give me takeoff power? And uh, they'd be like, okay, whatever. But we're going to do it conventionally here. And you can see I push my two throttles and we get moving. One thing we want to check is to make sure there's no red lights. We're good. All right, what are we looking for here? So we are looking for vibration, and that is the telltale sign that we're starting to get close. There's a the vibration. So when you start getting that vibration, that kind of bang, 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 bang on the water, what you need to do is you need to pull the control back just enough that the vibration seems to stop. And then we're just going to hold it there. If it starts to do this little kind of pitching thing, you just got to kind of catch it again. What you're trying to do is get the plane up on step here. That's good right there. That's good. Almost got it. Oh, 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 she's breaking. She's breaking. And now, as soon as we get in the air, we're just going to gently nose over and uh, take all those teacups downstairs and smack them up against the ceiling. And we're just going to hold ourselves just like this. What we're trying to do is keep our wing ground effect just long enough to build up a little bit of speed here. All right, we have speed. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the nose to gently come up on its own. Get right on the trim now, because remember, we're a gigantic airplane. And now you can see we've got ourselves a nice, gentle climb going on here. Now, one of the things you're probably observing after our little takeoff is the fact that it's a very difficult to identify things like how fast we're going, or are we traveling in a bad, good way or bad way. So let me zoom in a little bit so you can kind of see what's going on. So now that we're airborne here, I'm at, still at full power. You can see that we're climbing. We're about 150 meters, which is what you have there on the right, close on a 200. And we're climbing at about 190 kilometers per hour. This works out to be about 100 knots. Now, this seems to be a pretty decent balance between getting some climb speed out of this thing as well as not having an unusually high cabin angle. And again, this is not what I would consider to be a high-speed aircraft or high performance or anything. And we're actually flying at maximum weight today, so that makes things a little more challenging for us. So we're going to go ahead and execute a very gentle turn. And when I say gentle, I mean gentle. Think of this thing like uh, trying to fly the right flyer sort of a thing though, when you execute your initial turns here. We're not going to be doing, I uh, got about 5 or 10 degrees of bank. Uh, one of the things I was actually reading about this aircraft though, in the very, very early days when they were testing it, is they jammed 160 people on it, and Sarah was, I think it was uh, one of those, basically 100 people on this thing, and they actually had people leaning on one side of the airplane to the other for the purposes of improving the quality of the turns, which is just one of those things I find so incredibly fascinating. So we're going to kind of aim out towards the ocean here. I'm going to go ahead and again, you're going to need a pretty, uh, not too much rudder, believe it or not. The controls are pretty good. And there we are. I'm going to go ahead and give it a couple taps of trim. Uh, one of the things you'll find very fascinating at this point is it's actually very, 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 very stable. Um, you're, if I let go of the controls, which is what I'm doing right now, I have no hands on anything, you'll see it basically will hold the angle that you previously set it at, which is awesome. So we're going to climb up. Uh, when they said cruise altitudes on this thing, your typical cruise altitude was not very high. You're talking about 1,600 feet. You could get up to 10,000 if you had to, but it really wasn't intended to be used at altitudes like that. So if you take a look over on my left, uh, see how we're starting to close up on 500 meters? If you're looking for the meter equivalent, uh, we're looking for, like I said, about 500 meters is kind of the cruise altitude on this airplane. And you can see we're going to be hitting that in just a few moments here. And that's just about it. There we go, 500 meters. Again, not, not too high, not too low, kind of a thing like that. So I'm gonna gently nose over. Again, uh, you don't wanna do this too aggressively. This aircraft's a little funky. This is definitely one of those aircraft that you have to get on step. So I'm gonna go cruise up a little bit and I'm just gonna gently nose over and start bringing in that trim. 
and let it drift just a little bit down here. And all I'm doing is paying attention to my climb, my VSI right there, a very sticky instrument, and just kind of keeping it steady. Uh, don't chase your needles, obviously. You're just going to get it nice and balanced. Again, it will be a little involved the first couple of times you try to get this thing to do it at once. We're going to give a couple taps of trim, and uh, then we're going to start setting our cruise power. They did not give us any information on cruise power. So uh, we're going to use a standard, as you can see, 2300 RPM is considered our max performance there. It's probably safe to say that if it's 2300, we're probably looking somewhere between 2000 and 21, probably about 2000 RPM if we had to make an estimate here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull the throttle back. That's going to take us about, well, we'll call it, like I said, between 2000 and 2200 RPM. Should be a pretty good balance there. And we're just going to let it come back. Uh, well, about, like I said, about 2,000 RPM. Here we go, a little bit of a nose down trim here. Again, we have no automatic pilot, so we are on our own. There are some really neat plugins that give you automatic pilot capabilities if you're desiring to have them. Again, I'm just uh, gently, gently, gently applying some adjustments, and that should get us a cruise speed of, eh, it's probably going to be about 110 knots indicated, which is um, not exactly ripping along, but I think I've flown aircraft slower than that in the real world, so <laughs> I'm not complaining too much, actually, believe it or not. Let me give it just a tiny bit more nose up trim here. Eh, it's starting to sink a little bit. And you're going to need, you're going to have to play the trim game on this thing. This big aircraft, uh, just knowing how aircraft kind of trim in the real world is probably easier to trim than I'm probably making it. But that's pretty darn close right now. Okay, now that we've got it somewhat trimmed, and again, it's going to take a minute to sort of stabilize, so we can start walking around. <laughs> walking around, you say. So where are our navigational instruments? So if you come over here real quick, uh, we actually do have a little RMI in the corner. And uh, this is not the world's most sophisticated RMI. It's actually linked to everything that's going on inside of our radio control room. Now, the cool thing is this will act as a VOR receiver and will actually point in the correct directions of VOR. We just have to program it in the back itself. The other thing we have at our disposal as far as our navigational capabilities is we swing back here, we actually have a heading bug we can assign if we need to do so. Upside downside to this, of course, is you'll notice the heading bug is separate from the rest of the compass here. So for example, if I want to order a heading for a due south, this isn't due south. This is 310 degrees, and that's one of those little things you kind of got to watch out for. So if I want to head, uh, let's say, southwest, I set it to 240, don't, it's, it, this, is, this is our setting here. You know, that's just one of those things that you're going to have to be mindful of as we're cruising. And again, we're basically holding very, very steady at this particular point. No issues as far as that goes. So I'm going to float back here and I see how everything's going here. Oh, we got plenty of voltage. Engines must be kind of loud because all the engines are right above our head. Swing back here. Uh, things are running pretty smoothly. Again, our engine generators, you can snap them on or off if you need to, depending on what goes on. Down is on, by the way. So uh, one of the mistakes I made in the previous video was not clarifying this, but we do want to make sure those are pushed down so that we actually have our uh, engine being generated here, of course. <laughs> <laughs> just to remind us of the Dumkov in the uh, front seat kind of a thing like that. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to float back here to our little radio room, and uh, this is where we have our navigational instruments ready to go. All right, so our next thing we're going to take a look at is going to be our navigational suite here. We have an ADF radio in the middle, uh, very straightforward. All you do is you simply set the frequency here, and it'll show you on this little needle. Upside downside is the fact, of course, that um, I don't have any ADFs or NDBs anywhere in the vicinity of us. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to guess at that. But we do have this capability, and this is our handy dandy VOR. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is there is a little antenna slot here, which is basically telling us how much energy we're receiving from a particular antenna. But the nice thing is, if I just set on a frequency like a 11480, which is a Bar Harbor, we're up in Maine today. I needed something with a little bit better frame rate than Connecticut. <laughs> that sounds funny, but it is one of those kind of things you got to watch out for. Now, if you'll notice, our electro compass down here, our radio compass is uh, now telling us the correct direction. Now, the cool thing is, remember the little heading bug from up front? We can now come in here and actually dial that in if we needed to and actually dial in the specific bugs that we want. Now, the interesting thing, if uh, you're one of those folks who uh, uses external instruments, uh, this is kind of handy too, because you can actually set your external instruments to actually dial those particular frequencies in and fly them if that's something that you need to know. Uh, one other thing that I forgot to mention in the previous video also is our avionics master switch is actually back here. So in the event that you are using the radios, you need to make sure that you actually engage the avionics master switch. Otherwise, you're going to be in a situation where um, you're going to basically, you're not going to get any radio frequencies. You know, a lot of that stuff is not going to operate. Again, no automatic pilot or anything like that on here. You're kind of on your own as far as that goes. So if I jump back to the front seat and actually I kind of look down here, you'll see that my instruments are actually now indicating that I need to go ahead and take a bit of a turn here. So we're going to go ahead and uh, take a nice gentle right turn here. And I start lining ourselves up uh, towards the, the next uh, VOR station. We're basically going away from Bar Harbor VOR. And 
And that should line us up quite nicely, just like that. So that should be taking us away from that particular station that we just selected. Now, when you turn this plane, it has a tendency to get a little sinky on you. So you have to kind of like catch it. And it's just one of those things that it just, it's so much drag on the wing this size. You really got to kind of be mindful of it when you're turning. I usually tell people, stay away from the trim handle. The moment you start messing around with the trim handle, you're going to start having issues where it was perfect a second ago, and now I looked away, and now it's all messed up again. Like you can see, we're basically exactly at 500 meters. So we're doing okay. And again, no need for autopilot here. This thing is out cruising along perfectly fine as it is without any real difficulty. And that's, again, one of the things I'm very, very respectful of aircraft like this is the fact that they're this capable. Of course, now that everything's all queued up and ready to go, we can actually come down here and enjoy our flight. I mean, geez, I know what I'm doing. I'm coming over here and having some tea. Da -da -da. Oh, now one of the fun things I always like to say is, uh, by the way, you can open this window. I don't recommend it. So one of the things I always like to say is um, just because you can doesn't mean you should sort of thing. If they ever took away coffee, I'd be pretty mad. If they ever took away tea, I might get violent. It's just kind of one of those things. I really do enjoy a nice cup of tea. But now we can just sit here and play passenger. And like I said, oh, we've got no automatic pilot or anything. This thing is just trimmed down on its own right now. And it's just chilling which is one of the things I absolutely love and respect about this aircraft. We're about, like I said, about 2,200 RPM. Seems to get us a pretty hefty cruise. About 113, 114, everything's looking great. So now that that's all done, we've done our little cruise sequence. So we've decided to now land the plane. Uh, landing this plane is a process. Um, one of the things I discovered uh, kind of in my early experimentations with it is that when it does come time to try to land it, uh, one of the things you got to remember is the fact that it's you got to go pretty slow when you hit the water. A lot of times you can kind of just glide the boat into the water, but uh, this is different, this is what I mean. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna make a power reduction. I'm gonna come down to about uh, 15 inches of mercury, which of course, uh, we don't have that. And uh, we certainly wouldn't have an inch on a German plane kind of a thing like that. What we are gonna do is we're gonna make a power reduction here. You can see if I look my head down, I've gone from 2200 RPM to about, let's say 2000 RPM. It's a pretty substantial reduction in power. Now this thing has so much drag. Uh, one of the things you can actually do is hold this level like this. And by, by what I mean by level is literally, if I come down here to my attitude indicator, you can see we're basically right on it. And at that particular power, that's going to get you just about 500 RPM, depending on how careful you've been at this. Not 500 RPM, 500 feet per minute, sorry. And this is a very, very relaxing, slow descent. I'm not doing anything too aggressive here. We're still maintaining basically the same speed that we did uh, during cruise here, but we're not having to make any sudden adjustments one way or the other. Uh, the other thing, of course, is as you're making your way back down to the ground, uh, keep in mind, um, I look at the side of this, you'll get a kick out of this. Um, there's no landing lights. <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, we're on our own. So if uh, you are flying this at night or something, along those lines, keep in mind, uh, you're not going to have any advantage to that effect. So uh, when we land uh, big, big flying boats like this, you have to remember your landing distance is going to be measured in um, kilometers. It's not going to be measured in meters. It's kind of one of those sort of things. There are no short takeoff and landing procedures on this thing. Basically, the moment you hit the water, it's going to slow down to nothing almost instantaneously. So one of the things I will share with you is if you take a look here, we actually are a dual step. We have one step here in the middle, and we have another step here in the back. So what we're going to do is we're going to settle this part of our flying boat here into the water initially. Then we're going to use this part, and then we're going to settle the rest of the boat, kind of where this little kind of pontoon and sponson thing is. And again, uh, one of the things we always want to do is, as we are operating these aircraft in situations like this, is you always want to overfly whatever you intend to land on before you actually try to settle your plane into it. The reason you're going to want to do that, by the way, look at a generator, it's so cute. Uh, the reason you're going to want to do that, of course, is to confirm that there's no obstacles, or since we're in flight sim here, things like little tiny islands, which are technically little sandbars, I guess, that could uh, definitely ruin your flight. So just be kind of mindful of that as you're kind of making one of these passes like this over the top that you don't accidentally, so to speak. All right, let's go take a look at RPM. Uh, we gained a little tiny bit of RPM as we've uh, descended here, but again, nothing too, too bad here. Looking pretty darn good. Our flying our landing zone here. Uh, we're basically going to come, to, we're going to do a big circle and kind of between here, and then we'll get the tugboat to kind of pull us in. All right, there we go. We've got about, uh, yeah, like I said, about 500 feet per minute here. It's coming down pretty quick. It's about two meters per second, which is perfectly fine. And we'll go ahead and execute our turn. Just remember when you execute turns in this, you don't need a lot of rudder. You know, this is not a 152. You don't have to stomp on your right foot in order to get this thing to execute a safe turn. You just have to kind of give it that little tiny bit. And again, when you are banking this thing, there's a very, very strong overbanking tendency. So just kind of be mindful of that. But this right here is good. If you take a look at that little kind of doodad sitting there, I'm going to determine our wind velocimeter or something like that. I'm never going to get the name of that right. 
Uh, the cool thing with that is you can actually use it as a little point on the horizon to kind of determine where you need to be. As a general rule, uh, like if I point this down just a teeny tiny bit, this is level. So if you want to think about it another way, um, this is, it looks like we're pointing down, but we're actually pointing relatively level here. It does not give you the best position, but if you look at the top of the little ring there, right in the little kind of upper third of it, that gives you a good idea visually of what the uh, top uh, what level looks like. So right here, you can see just a little bit of the ring showing through the land. That's about level if you're looking for a kind of a visual reference. Again, if I were a pilot on this thing, what I would actually do is I'd probably get out a black margin marker and draw it. <laughs> that way I don't have to constantly be looking over there to my right as I'm coming around here. All right, so we've gotten ourselves uh, we're about 300 feet up, uh, not very high. And again, that's a nice thing about sea level here. I love the fact you have the high precision version of it, and you can see we're about 100 meters up, which is a pretty good place to kind of look around as we get set up for approach here. So our approach to landing is relatively straightforward. It's all about keeping your speed up and then basically settling onto that first step here. And my tendency to try to mash the right foot is so real in this moment. Again, we're gonna come around again, keeping that power at about 2200 RPM, believe it or not. We're gonna use that power quite a bit here and be careful not to pitch up too much. And like I said, be careful not to tilt too much. Remember all those T-sets downstairs? Yeah, you remember now. <laughs> all right, we're gonna line up between these two islands. And we're gonna go ahead and level ourselves off like this. Now, if you're wondering why they give us the high precision uh, metometer, <laughs> I know it's an altimeter on meters, is it gives you the advantage of being able to see exactly how close you are to hitting the water. Uh, that's really, really nice because um, it's very, very tricky to land this plane. Now, I'm still at 2200 RPM here. I've not actually reduced my power. You don't want to go chop and drop. Uh, what you want to do is as you get progressively closer is you want to slowly start making those reductions to kind of control that descent rate at those last pieces. So like right now, you can see that my descent rate is basically zero. I'm just backing the throttle out to probably about a third power or so, and I'm just bleeding a little bit of the speed off. When we get into ground effect with this plane, it is real. So again, I'm, you can see I've got about half a meter per second is my descent rate right now, and I'm just backing the power off back in the power off and just hold that water wing and water ground effect <laughs> and now we are about zero power if you start to see the nose start to come up just gently apply a little bit of power and there's the top of the skid right there and what we're going to do is we're just going to gently back the power out and we're going to be manipulating our elevators to try to keep the bounce out and again you can hear my engine slowly spoiling down there and now we're going to let the plane sink into the water there it is now hold the nose up just a tiny bit There we are, we're doing about 35, 40 knots. <sighs> and we're down, just like that. And you can see how we sink into the water without any difficulty. And it's not that challenging, like I said, as far as like, getting this thing all set up. There's a little gas control. And of course, so we do have some brakes on this. Uh, I don't recommend using them for that particular purpose. But if you pop this sucker open real quickly here, you can always tap the anchor if you need to stop you in a hurry. And once I press that, you can see the entire aircraft now settles very nice and neatly into the water itself. So now that we're down in the water, uh, there's a couple different things we can do as far as uh, preparing our aircraft uh, for different parts. Whoa, hold on just a second. We can prepare to actually get this thing kind of bouncing around in the water a little bit. So we have this big wheel right here, and this is actually a water rudder. So if I click this, you'll actually see that it's one of these kinds of things so where we have to basically crank it. And what we've done is we can't really see this well, but in the back, there's actually a little rudder that we just sort of stuck in the water. Now, the thing you got to watch out for with this aircraft is uh, once we're in that, let me go ahead and disengage my anchor here, um, is you're going to get some kind of funkiness as far as handling goes. And you'll observe that that water rudder doesn't stick the water rudder into it. It controls my turning of the water. So if I back this out a little bit, you'll notice that the aircraft just starts actually spinning the other way. Now, it's just kind of one of those little things. It's like, why, 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 why didn't they just make it so like you could use your feet to do this? This would be a lot easier if I could just sit here and kind of crank it sort of thing. And you can see is as I'm adjusting this, I'm adjusting which direction my aircraft is actually traveling. Oh, it's so awkward. <laughs> Don't crank it too much one way or the other. It's going to give you all sorts of fun trouble there. And there we go. We can actually keep it nice and straight if we need it to. Just another one of those little fun, kind of fun things that they sort of put in there to make it a little more fun for you kind of piece. So as you can see, incredible aircraft. Um, a lot of things that are really, really neat on this one itself as far as um, operations goes. It's, it's slick. It really, really is slick. And of course, if we needed to, we could call up the tugboat again and basically request it. Um, we can't get a tugboat, by the way, until the engines are disengaged. A bunch of different ways to shut the engines off. Of course, on this particular aircraft, we can pop the magnetos. Safest way, of course, with anything is that we can actually go to the mixture control, the fuel control, 
we can actually crank that all the way back down to zero, and that will all get the engines to cut off pretty much instantaneously there. And you can see we get a bunch of red lights all coming on at the same time. Now we actually have the ability to call up the little tugboat. The little tugboat will come out of nowhere, and now we can use him to basically pull us into the shore. So as you can see, an absolutely awesome plane, a ton of fun. It requires a lot of room to take off and land. Pretty easy to operate. It's really different in VR, so definitely check that out if you get the chance. Enjoy.